We're going to talk about the Grim Reaper Paradox, a very interesting thought experiment. But before that, I want to also mention its creator, Alexander Proust. I'll let William Lane Craig give his thoughts on Dr. Proust's credentials, which he shared in an episode of Pints with Aquinas. Um, who do you think is the most formidable atheist today, the most formidable champion of I think today? without a doubt it's Graham Oppie, your yeah. fellow, yeah. Uh, your compatriot. Yeah. Uh, he is scary smart, <laughs> scary smart. And so here's my next question. If you could choose one Christian apologist other than yourself to debate him publicly, who would you choose? Wow. I know who would be <clears throat> capable of doing it intellectually, but I've never heard him really in a debate context. And, but that would be Alexander Proust ah, yes. at Baylor University, who is, again, <laughs> scary smart. <laughs> Proust has earned doctorates in both philosophy and mathematics mm. and would easily be on a par with Oppie. So, yeah, this guy's pretty smart. Now, Alexander Proust is a huge proponent of a view called causal finitism. This is the view that the causal history of everything must be finite. So if we took the history of all the things that had a causal chain of influence on, say, a chair, the list must be finite. It must end at some point. According to causal finitism, this is a law of metaphysics that must be true. Now, if causal finitism is true, then this is a pretty good tool for apologetics. All the things that exist can be traced through their causal history back to a causal starting point. That looks a lot like there's a god who made everything. Now Alexander Proust defends causal finitism this way. He brings up a bunch of seemingly possible scenarios which actually lead to paradoxes and contradictions. Then he shows that they would be outlawed under causal finitism for one reason or another. The more scenarios you could do this for, the more evidence you have that causal finitism is true, since it explains so well why these contradictory scenarios aren't actually reached. One such scenario is the Grim Reaper Paradox. Let's go through it. This is Fred. Don't get emotionally attached to Fred, because he's going to die soon. You see, it's 10 o'clock and Fred is sound asleep in bed, but there's a Grim Reaper which has a death warrant on Fred to kill him instantly at 12 o'clock. Will this Grim Reaper kill Fred? Well, this reaper is completely unstoppable, but there's also another reaper scheduled to kill Fred. This one is scheduled to kill Fred halfway between 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock at 11.30. There's also a grim reaper scheduled to kill Fred halfway between 11.30 and 11 o'clock at 11.15. There's also a grim reaper scheduled to kill Fred halfway between 11.15 and 11 o'clock at 11.07 and 30 seconds, and so on with infinite reapers. Poor Fred literally has infinity, unstoppable creatures scheduled to kill him. Now, between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, Fred is alive and healthy, able to survive anything, except of course the overpowered insta-kill of a Grim Reaper. But after 11 o'clock, Fred is obviously dead. He can't escape the wrath of one deadly Reaper, let alone infinity of them. Now here's the question that makes the paradox. Which Reaper killed Fred? Let's see if it was the Reaper at 12 o'clock. Well, it couldn't have been the 12 o'clock Reaper, because the 11.30 Reaper would have beaten him to the job. So, we could be absolutely certain that the 12 o'clock Reaper did not kill Fred. Now, did the 11.30 Reaper kill Fred? No, it couldn't have, because the 11.15 Reaper would have beaten him to the job. So, we could be absolutely certain that the 11.30 Reaper did not kill Fred. We could use the same logic on literally every Reaper. So, we could be absolutely certain that no matter which Reaper you pick, it didn't kill Fred. None of the Reapers are the ones who killed him. So we have a scenario where Fred was killed by a Grim Reaper, and yet no Grim Reaper killed Fred. This is just a plain contradiction. So we should probably accept some view like causal finitism to rule out from the outset that there could be an infinite number of Reapers having a cause and effect relation on Fred. Now, someone skeptical of this argument might say, well, not so fast. Maybe no individual Reaper killed Fred, but we could say that the collection of all Reapers, or the myriological sum of the Reapers, if you want to be fancy, killed Fred. We're going to treat the collection of the Reapers as a thing itself and say that it led to the death of Fred, even though none of the individuals making up this collection killed Fred. This avoids the contradiction. Now, I'm skeptical of this response. I don't feel like treating the collection of Reapers as a thing itself is a valid move. But I don't think skeptics care a whole lot about my feelings, so I came up with an argument against this line of reasoning. Say I have a red ball at 10 o'clock. Now there's a blue maker, which is a being which has the power to turn things which are red, and only things which are red, into blue things. And it will turn my red ball into a blue one if at 12 o'clock the ball is still red. 
there is another blue maker which is going to turn the ball blue halfway between 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock at 11.30. Then there is one which is going to turn the ball blue in between 11 and 11.30 at 11.15 and so on with infinite blue makers. Now we get a similar Grim Reaper paradox. Between 10 and 11, the ball is red, but after that, the ball is blue. But no blue maker used its power to actually turn the ball blue. Now here's my argument. What if the ball is red between 10 and 11, but it's yellow after that? Is this any less surprising than the ball becoming blue? Well, no, it isn't. Any reason that you can give me for why the ball shouldn't turn yellow is also reason that the ball won't turn blue. For example, one reason that the red ball shouldn't become yellow is that nothing used its power to make the red ball into a yellow ball. But that's also a reason that the ball shouldn't become blue. Nothing used its power to turn a red ball into a blue ball either. No matter what reason you give me that the ball shouldn't be yellow, it couldn't be parodied into a reason why it shouldn't be blue. So if you think that the collection of blue makers has the power to make the red ball into a blue ball, then you should also accept that the collection of blue makers can just as easily make the red ball into a yellow ball. I liked this argument, but I wasn't sure how well it would stand up to scrutiny, so I decided to post it in the comments of Alexander Proust's blog to see if it was any good. To my utter delight, Alexander Proust actually responded to my comment. He said, that's a very nice argument indeed, I like it a lot. He even said, and I quote, I would use it in my book if I had the opportunity for backwards causation, smiley face. And that wasn't the end of it. He immediately went on to make a blog post where, because the dude is a genius, he shared another argument against this idea that collections of things together can make something happen without its members acting. Imagine you have an empty sack. Now there's an infinite series of jolly givers, beings each with a unique name who are holding an apple. They are scheduled to instantly look in your sack and if it's empty, they will put the apple in the sack. They're spaced out in the regular paradox-inducing order, with jolly givers at 12 o'clock, 11.30, 11.15, and so on. Now after 11 o'clock, there must be some fruit in your sack. But which jolly giver doesn't have his apple? Well, none of them are missing their apple. So how can the collection of jolly givers put an apple in the sack if no individual jolly giver lost an apple? In Proust's blog, he then links to my very clever comment to quote him, and points out that there's no reason that the fruit you find in your sack should even be an apple. Why doesn't a banana, for example, appear in the sack? In Proust's post, he actually uses oranges and pears, but I don't have the right colored markers for that. Anyways, it seems to me that, really, everyone should just believe causal finitism. It seems like the best way to avoid all these paradoxes. That's the end of this video, thanks for watching.